With this lecture, we're beginning a new topic in the course that we're going to be looking at for about three weeks. That topic is called fractals, but I don't want to tell you what that word means quite yet. I don't think it would make much sense if I just tried to, to give you a definition to start off. And instead, what I'm going to do is to begin with a couple of examples in this lecture and the following lecture. The first example that I want to do is something called the Coke snowflake. So let me begin telling you about that now. Now I should say that this is also in the textbook. You can see what I'm telling you here in very much the same terms in section 12.1 of the text. And what we're going to do, as they do there, is to begin with an equilateral triangle. That's all it is. Now for purposes of what we're going to do, we're going to call that the seed. From this, we're going to start growing other stuff. And step one in the construction is to glue three smaller triangles, as indicated in this picture, onto the three sides of the triangle you began with. Now, they are smaller in the sense that, although they are, again, equilateral triangles, the side length of each of these is just one-third the side length of the initial equilateral triangle. So these are smaller triangles, and we're gluing them on, as shown on the three sides. And we get something that you may know as a Star of David. And uh, it has 12 edges, as you can see. You can either count them, or you can realize that we had three edges to begin with, and each of those edges has now been replaced with four shorter edges, so that we have 12 edges. Step two. Well, we now have 12 edges, and onto the middle third of each of those edges, we now glue an even smaller triangle. I'm showing you with dots. The dots are just to show where I'm putting on those new triangles. And as you can see, I've put on 12 new triangles. And Again, what I've done is I've taken the existing 12 edges and I've replaced them by shorter edges. And again, multiplying by 4, you'll see that we have 48 edges. Okay, now you can probably guess what we're going to do in step 3. And what we're going to do is onto the middle third of each of those 48 edges, we're going to glue an even smaller triangle. Now this begins to look something like a snowflake, perhaps, or the boundary of a snowflake. And again, multiplying by 4, the resulting figure has 192 edges. Well, now you can't be mistaken about what I'm going to do next. Surely you think I'm going to glue on some more triangles, even smaller triangles. You're right. I'm going to glue on 192 even smaller triangles onto the middle third of all of the edges I had at step 4. And this resulting figure has 768 edges. And of course, I want to do it again. I don't want to stop this process. So I glue on even more. This time, I'm gluing on 768 triangles. This gives me something even more convoluted with 3,072 edges. And now we're beginning to reach the limit of what you can draw and see in a picture on a screen. Uh, but let's take it one more stage. and. The resulting figure now obtained, of course, by gluing small, small triangles onto the middle thirds of the edges that you had at the previous stage now has 12,288 edges. Now I want to continue this process forever, or at least imagine that I've continued it forever. Despite the fact that I'm gluing on infinitely many triangles, very soon the picture that we see stabilizes. But I really want to think about having done that infinitely often, continuing that process forever. And the resulting curve that we get, the resulting curve, which is the limit of all these steps, is an intricate curve, which is called the Koch curve. Now here we're just seeing an animation of the steps I just went through, just so you can visualize it all at once. Let me try to run that again for you. So here it is again.
Now, what will be true at every stage and also will be true in the limit, that is to say with the Koch curve, is that it encloses a region in the plane. We can imagine dumping paint into there, say, coloring it in, and the region inside is called the Koch snowflake. So the curve that we constructed is called the Koch curve, and this interior of it, which is a two-dimensional region, has an area, it's called the Koch snowflake. Let's say a little bit about the history. This uh, object that we're studying is named for a Swedish mathematician. His name was Niels Fabian Helga von Koch, born in 1870, died in 1924. His construction of the uh, Koch curve and the Koch snowflake is honored with this pair of stamps, Swedish postage stamps. Now let's do a little bit of analysis. What I want to do is I want to first of all figure out what is the length of the Koch curve. Now let's just decide that the unit we're using at the beginning is one edge length, okay? Each edge has a length one. You can imagine that's of an inch or a foot or whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. The point is it's the unit length, okay? So what's the total length or the perimeter of this triangle? Well, of course, it's three. Now, at step one, what did we do? Well, these edges are shorter than the edges we had originally. In fact, as we've already noted, these shorter edges have length one-third. But how many of them are there? Well, there are 12 of them, okay? So just multiplying 12 edges by length one-third, we get now that the perimeter, the total length, is four rather than three. At step two, the edges are even shorter. Their lengths are one-third of one-third, which is one-ninth. Each edge has length one-ninth, and there are 48 of those edges. So the total length of this curve, in other words, the perimeter of the region, is 48 times one-ninth. That becomes the reduced fraction 16 thirds, or if we write it as a decimal, 5.3 repeating. What we're doing at every stage is we're taking an edge of some length and we're replacing it by four shorter edges, as we can see here. Those shorter edges are each one-third the length of the replaced edge, but there's four of them, okay? So as you can see, what we're doing to each of those lengths of a single edge is replacing it by something that has length four-thirds. So that means at each step, we're going to be multiplying the length of the curve by the factor four-thirds. So that what we get is, in fact, what we've earlier called in this course a geometric sequence. That is to say, the length of the curve, which is tabulated in the bottom row of this table, is obtained in a, a very simple fashion. We start with three, the initial length. We multiply by four-thirds so as to get four. We multiply by four-thirds again so as to get 5.333 and so on. And then we multiply again by four-thirds and we do that at every step. We can also see the calculation in a slightly different way. The number of edges is always being multiplied by 4. We start with 3, then we have 12, then we have 48, then 192. These are numbers that we saw earlier. Again, if we look across that row, we can see that this is a geometric sequence. The initial term is 3, and the common ratio is 4. We're always multiplying by 4. As for the lengths of the edges, well, again, if we think about them in, in a row, as I've indicated here, well, then those are the terms of another geometric sequence. Here we're always multiplying by one-third, right? We have a, an edge of length one at the beginning, and then we have edges of length one-third, and then we have edges of length one-ninth, and so on. Now, if you take the entry in the first row, looking at any column, take the entry in the first row, and multiply by the entry in the second row, of course, that will give you the length of the curve down below. You're, you're, you're multiplying number of edges times the length of the curve. So there's two different ways to understand this calculation in the bottom row, either as generated itself by the rule for generating a geometric sequence, or by taking the two geometric sequences up above and multiplying term by term their values. 
So this is what is summarized at the bottom. The length of each edge is increasingly small. Each edge has one-third the length of the edge at the previous step, but the number of edges grows by a factor of four. That means that the perimeter grows by a factor of four-thirds. Now, what's happening there? What's happening to the length of the curve? Well, it's getting longer and longer and longer. There's no upper bound. As we multiply by four-thirds, infinitely often we get a sequence which is marching off to infinity. That is to say, the only reasonable interpretation of what we get in the limit is a curve which has infinite length. Now, this is not a totally unfamiliar concept. If we take a straight line or if we take a parabola, something like that, that has infinite length. But those are curves which themselves go off to infinity, whereas obviously the Koch curve is something which we can draw on a single uh, picture. It's bounded. Nevertheless, this curve has infinite length. Now, before I end this lecture, I want to calculate something else. I want to calculate the area that this curve encloses, the area of the Koch snowflake. So let's do that. This is a little bit more intricate. To begin with, let's just say that the area of our triangle is 1. Right? We can do that. Right? We can just say that's area 1. The amount of paint that's needed to fill that in is 1 unit of paint. Okay? And we're going to measure all other areas of the construction using this as our unit. Okay, so let's try to understand what happens at step one. Well, <coughs> what we need to do at step one is we need to glue on four triangles. Sorry, not four, three triangles. And how big are those triangles? Well, this picture here is showing you that if you think about the initial big triangle and then you think about these smaller triangles that you want to glue onto them, you can actually piece together nine of these smaller ones to make up the bigger one. Okay, so this new triangle that we're going to put on to each edge has area just one-ninth the area of the seed, not one-third. It's one-ninth the area of the seed. Okay, and this is true at every step in the construction. In general, each new triangle which is added on at stage n has one-ninth the area of the triangles added on at stage n minus one. All right, so now let's look at step one, okay? So the seed has area one. We have now glued on at three places, three smaller triangles. We know that their area is one-ninth. Each one of them has area one-ninth. So the total area at step one is one plus three-ninths. Okay, now step two. Well, these new triangles have area one-ninth the area of the triangles at the previous step, but the area at the previous step was already one-ninth, so we need one-ninth of one-ninth, in other words, one-ninth times one-ninth, which is one over 81. Also, as we know, there are 12 of these triangles that we're adding on, so what we need to add on to the area we already had at step one is 12 over 81. I find it convenient not to add this up. I want to display the terms that I'm using. So it's 1 from the seed, 3 ninths that we picked up at step 1, and now 12 over 81 that we picked up at step 2. Okay, what happens at step 3? Well, at step 3, as shown in this chart, the new triangles are going to each have area 1 over 729. And that's just one-ninth times one over 81. Also, the number of new triangles is 48. That's four times as many as we had at the previous stage. So at each stage, beginning with the seed and then going through the steps, we can see how much area we've added on. At the beginning, you might not want to call it added area. It's the initial area is one. At step one, we've added on three times one-ninth, or one-third or 0 0.333, that's our added area. At step two, we have to take 12 triangles. Each has area 1 over 81. The added area is 0 0.148, and so on. So the entries I'm getting in that third row are simply what you get by multiplying the entries immediately above, the two entries. Now, we're not just taking this new area by itself. We're adding it on to the area we already have. So I need one more row to accumulate. 
I start with a total area of 1, and then I add on the 1 third, and then I add on the 12 over 81, and so on. So I'm actually coming up with a total in the bottom row, the total area. And the interesting thing now is this is not going to infinity. In fact, it seems pretty clear that it's going to some finite value. And by a calculation that one learns how to do in a course in calculus, which is called summing the terms of a geometric series, one can easily come up with, in fact, the limiting area, the area which is enclosed by the Koch curve. And that turns out to be exactly 1.6.